On today's review bench, a very underrated 6 core, the FX 6300. Doesn't that look nice? As promised last week, we have part 2 of AMD of old. This time, it's the FX 6300 from 2012 that is still on sale today and fits in the AM3 Plus architecture. It's a 3.5 GHz 6 core that turbos to 4.1 and features 4 megs of L2 cache that is shared as well as 8 megs of L3 cache, which is, again is shared. This is why many people will argue that this is a 3 core with 6 thread paths. A couple benchmarks tell me the same, but in gaming, it's all cores, man. This thing just performs amazing. And I'll show you now with our benchmarks. Before we go any further, we should look at price. The FX8300 comes in at about $89 and does include a free game. Right now it's including Ashes of Singularity, which is about a $40 game US, so you've now basically paid $49 for a processor, which is very nice. If you can't afford a very high-end gaming system for a lot of money, the FX6300 is definitely a sweet spot for many gamers, mostly due to the fact that Ryzen and Cabby Lake come in at a lot more money. Just the processor alone for a good i7 or for Cabby Lake is going to cost you the same as building a budget gaming system using the FX6300. For all of today's game tests, we did overclock the FX6300 to 4.5 GHz on all 6 cores. This is very easily done, and a quick Google search will show you how. It is actually unbelievably simple to overclock this core, and a lot easier than I was expecting. I know that when I was fighting with the 1055 trying to use frontside bus overclocking, I ran into nothing but issues, but with just clicking the multiplier up a few times, we were able to hit 4.5, and it ran perfectly stable with a minor voltage Increase. I definitely, definitely recommend this board and CPU together. We were using the Gigabyte G1 970 Gaming, which is an awesome board for overclocking and gaming. With that out of the way, let's take a look at these benchmarks. On Battlefield 1, turning off the X12 and setting everything to very high, basically just clicking the very high preset and 1080p. On minimum, we got 41 frames per second. On our average, we got 72. And on our maximum, we got 125. This left a very playable and very enjoyable game experience. But once we cooked that overclock in, things got a lot smoother. We went up to 57 on the minimum, 91.69 on the average, and 136 on the maximum. This makes Battlefield 1 a lot more enjoyable and look absolutely gorgeous. Now, from World War 1 to the gates of hell, we jump back into Doom. Still loving this game, and on high preset, using OpenGL 4.3 and 1080p, on our minimum frames per second, we were getting 37. On the stock average, we got 51.6, and on the max, we were seeing 68. This left a very playable game, and felt more like a console than I would say a high-end PC. Again, this is kind of odd, because I feel like the CPU isn't the bottleneck, I feel like it's more my graphics card, but... As I'll show you at the very end, there is something up this processor's sleeve and this graphics card that makes it so Doom is super enjoyable, but leaves it a little hard for my review to cover. <laughs> I'll get into that at the very end, so stay tuned for that, or just skip ahead to that if you want to see how I made Doom run like there is no tomorrow and look absolutely beautiful. But with the processor overclocked to 4.5, our minimum hit 39. Our average at 61.41, which is what I want to see, at least 60 on the average, which makes the game feel very enjoyable, but this isn't what I was talking about. Uh, it has something to do with uh, some Star Trek terms, and we'll get into that at the very end, but uh, the final is the max at 4.5 gigahertz. We hit 89 frames per second, making the game very playable and very enjoyable. A minor overclock can make a world of difference, and with Doom, it definitely did. From demons from hell on Mars to irradiated ghouls and super mutants in Boston, we have Fallout 4 on the Ultra preset and 1080p. Minimum frames per second are 21 on stock, 50 as the average on stock, and 62 is the highest on stock. Now with that 4.5 gigahertz overclock, we get 25 as the minimum, 51.652 as our average, and again 62 as our max. For Fallout 4, it's actually quite GPU intensive, and it is our GPU that's maxing out at 100%. So, the FX6200 is definitely a great processor for this game, where the HD290X might not be 
really the best GPU to use for this game as it's getting a little long in the tooth, but it runs quite well nonetheless. The game was very enjoyable and I didn't have any real problems throughout the gameplay. From Fallout 4, we jump over to GTA 5. GTA 5 was highly recommended as everybody said it was extremely processor intensive and was really hard on the FX series processors. In my testing, I gotta say, bullshit. It runs perfectly fine. Minimum frames per second on stock, 37. Average, 53.4. And on max, we got 117. With a minor overclock of that 4.5 GHz, we got a minimum of 48, an average of 67.768, and a highs of 134. I do think that the complaints about AMD and Grand Theft Auto V are going to fall onto either the GPU or Intel fanboys. All in all, this processor did great. I honestly had no problems playing this game that had to do with the processor other than my lack of complete skill. GTA 5 and the FX 6300 definitely get a check at running very smoothly together. The real bottleneck here is your graphics card. From GTA 5, we jump into the esports games. We got CSGO, very high preset, 1080p, and on the minimum frames per second we were seeing 99. Stock average, 183. Stock highs was 293. On that 4.5 GHz overclock, we got 156 as the minimum, 230 as the average, and 298 as the maximum. The FX 6300 definitely handles CSGO without any problem, as pretty much any processor today will. It ran it nice and smooth, and if you're looking at any esports games, the FX 6300 might be a good processor if you're looking to do a value build. Only if you're looking to do a value build. The upgrade path from here isn't very high. Hi, you don't have a lot of options, you could go up to an 8 core, which I'm going to be looking at one 8 core before Ryzen's release, as I believe it's worth looking at some of these really low cost processors for the people that aren't going to be able to afford Cabby Lake or Ryzen, as they got to get some love too, it's not really fair to them just to sit back and look at their entire budget for a system is less than they'd pay for one new processor, where if they're building a budget system, the FX 6300 is a great option. From here, I'm going to drop all the little frames per second charts and we're going to look at two really different results I got while testing the FX 6300. So back to Battlefield 1. Right now, we have everything on the very high preset and I've turned on DX12. As you can see, the processor's usage has dropped drastically, but the GPU is jumping all over the place. The game's performance definitely dropped, and the enjoyability of the game dropped drastically. It looks a little bit nicer, I'll give it that, and the processor definitely is not your bottleneck here, but my uh, 290X could not handle this game properly here on very high settings. The game was enjoyable, I guess. It was playable, but at times times it did have mass frame spikes, and my recording software kept crashing constantly. If you were going to play this game on DX12, maybe set it for the high settings and it makes it a lot more enjoyable. On very high, if you're running a 290X, it's not going to be enough, but the FX 6300 on DX12 runs really smoothly, and I didn't actually see it hit 100% at any point in time, which is really good to see. Now let's jump over to Doom. Like with DX12, Vulcan gave me some weird issues with recording. My FPS counters all gave me issues, fraps would not run properly and kept crashing, so let's just take a look here. Our average frame per second seem in the mid hundreds, which is very nice to see, a massive jump in performance, and the game ran so much smoother and so much quicker. Uh, 60 frames per second seems to be the drop from time to time in the big battles, but most of the time we're seeing the high hundreds. This seems to be a massive increase in performance when Vulcan is enabled, and the processor usage actually seemed to jump up and down a lot more than I saw with uh, running OpenGL. Vulcan seems to be a huge step in the right direction and looks absolutely stunning. The gameplay actually feels far, far smoother, and the game to me looked much, much better. If you're going to go with a multi-core processor like a 6-core or an 8-core, uh, Vulcan games are going to be great for you. I can see why Doom was originally packaged with this processor, as Doom plays so well with the FX6300 that you just scream this thing is running way better than it actually does. Does it run bad? No. The FX6300 throughout my entire testing cycle was a lot of fun to use. 
I am really disappointed with the hate this processor got, with the fact that on my forum and other forums people always said terrible things that AMD didn't have anything back in that day. If you would have bought this processor in 2012 when it came out, the last 4 years you would have had no issues. The FX6300 is a great processor, and at $89 or less, it's an absolute steal. If you're looking to build a, a system for yourself or for somebody else who can't afford one, look at the FX6300 for a low cost budget build, as it's going to be a great processor for that. If you got all the money in the world, completely skip by this processor and jump right over to Ryzen or Cabby Lake. This is Soldus121 with Real Hard Reviews. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Tell us if you like these videos and if we should keep making them, as well as what you'd like to see changed or what other games you'd like included. Again, I am Soldus121 of Real Hard Reviews. Thanks for watching and you have an epic day.